So today I'll be talking about uh, enthalpy heat capacities, and uh, I'll be going on talking about the the first law means uh, and uh, enthalpy heat capacity, and slowly we'll go into the second law. So uh, remember we talked about first law, and we have already given a statement of first law in the differential form. This is like delta U B U plus delta Q plus delta W, and you can write it in the integral form. Means in a more so that becomes like this is the differential form. Again, these are path differentials, as you can see here. That these are path differentials, and if I do this, delta u goes to q plus w, right? And this is called the differential form. This is the differential form. And this is something that you get after integration. So when you do integration, for example, u is a state function. So you are integrating between the initial and the final state, or between two states. So you get delta u, and q and w again depends on the path, right? So we said this is basically uh, we can call it like uh, this is more like a integral form, or we can call it like the the the, the means where you have done the measurement. Over say two states, right? This is like that. So it is after integration, right? So this is the integral form. Now, as I told you, so when you have a closed system, you have a closed system, then energy transfer is something that is allowed, right? Energy transfer between the system and surrounding is allowed, but the wall is impermeable. Uh, although the wall is diathermal, right? Diathermal means allows heat transfer and exchange between the system and surroundings. But it's impermeable. That is, it does not allow exchange of matter, right? So, in such cases, for closed systems, this is the first law. Now, what about open system? Open system means, for example, I have taken this system. This is my system boundary. Please understand, this is my system boundary. This dotted line represents my system boundary, and there is some some substance that is pushed in, and substance that is pushed out, right? Matter pushed in, matter pushed out. So basically, uh, it, this this open system allows exchange of matter as well as energy. So it is allowing exchange of matter as well as exchange of energy, right across the boundary. Now in these cases, when you have such a system, a steady state, for example, steady state means we are not talking about any rate of accumulation or stuff. So then uh, we have to include something called flow work. Because you are pushing in some matter here, you are pushing in some matter, you are taking out some matter. Okay, it can be like some fluid, uh, some some solid, whatever it is. Now, when you are pushing in some matter, obviously you are putting some means. If you are pushing in some matter, then you are applying some pressure on it, right? And you are push, you are taking out some matter. Then basically, again, it is uh, uh, you are basically when you are forcing, then you are putting a force on it or pressure on it. And when you are taking it out, then you are relieving some of the pressure. So that is how we can think of it. So this work that happens is called flow work. Now, for example, we tell that the amount of substance that uh, the, the substance that comes in, I specify using something like V in. V in is the volume input and our volume at the inlet of that substance that you are pushing in, and M in is the mass of the substance that we are pushing in. And again, V out and M out are the volume of the substance that you are pushing out, and volume of matter that you are pushing out, and M is the mass of matter that you are pushing out. So basically, now as you can see in the open system, there is some mass pushed in, or some matter pushed in, which is some mass, and some matter pushed out, right? So in that open system, although it has all these other things that that there is an internal energy like you, and then there is also you can have some uh, some some other processes. But there is also this process where you are pushing in some matter and taking out some matter, right? So you are taking out some matter and you are pushing in some matter. <clears throat> now, in such cases, if you have such an open system, we can think of there is a pressure at the inlet and there is a pressure at the outlet, which is again related to the flow work. And we can call uh, so now we can think of a specific quantity, which is basically volume. Per unit 
mass in so that means you are uh, the the m in is the mass at the inlet right mass of matter that is pushed in the open system now v bar in is a specific quantity right it's a specific quantity per unit mass or per unit mole so and what we are doing v, v v bar in is nothing but v in by m in right and similarly you can have v bar out which is v bar out will be v out by m in right so there is a flow work in and there is a flow work out and we call it wf in and wf out now you see when you are pushing in some matter you are applying some pressure p in right so there is a p in there so we can call it p v bar delta m or d m is a basically a state function so i can replace this with uh, d p v bar d m which is basically so p v bar d so p d v so what i am doing is i write this p d v right where p is the p in say p in say and then there is d v and d v so what i am doing is i am writing d v equals to v bar d right v bar d m because v bar is volume per unit mass right so p v bar d m which is delta w f right that's the that's the flow work now p bar dm is positive when matter is entering when matter enters p v bar dm is positive because it is what uh, you can think of it as like some work done on the system and when p bar dm is coming out that means matter is coming out then p p bar dm is negative right so because what is coming in we are taking as positive that's convention and p bar dm out we are taking it as uh, negative Right, again a convention. So whatever is coming in is basically giving you a positive contribution. Coming out is giving you a negative contribution. So if I now do this, I have WF in, which is P V bar in D M, and D M in this is, and this is, and P is constant in let let's call it P in. So basically, if you look at this integral, so P which is constant then let this P in. So I take out P, so P in. V bar in also I can take out and D M in I am taking from zero to M in right because it was initially nothing was there and then I have pushed in some matter so zero to M in and so zero to M in means basically it will be plus P in V bar in M in that is my W F in right the flow work that is in there. and the flow work that is output will be minus P out V bar out M in. so if that is so moreover the matter that we are pushing in has some internal energy again i can define something like u in by m in which is nothing but u bar in which is specific is like a specific internal energy Bar unit mass entering the system. Similarly, u bar out will be the specific internal energy associated with the mass that is leaving the system. So this is specific internal energy. Associated with the mass that is entering, this is the specific energy. Is it mass that is leaving? And then you have delta Q, which is plus U in D M in, and then you have minus U out, D M out, and you also had W delta um, delta W F in the flow work input, and then the flow work output, which is P in V bar in D M in, P out v, minus P out V out V bar out D M out. So whatever. You can see that sign convention that is followed is anything that is coming in corresponds to the same closed system convention that we followed. That heat input is positive. Similarly, uh, the flow work that involves matter coming in and along with the matter, the flow work coming, in, flow work that is done to push the matter in and the internal energy associated with that matter that is pushed in. All of these we are taking as positive, and whatever is leaving the system we are taking as negative. Right? We are taking as negative. Now, so. If I have to now balance the energies, what I get is du. Du is the change in energy. It's an infinitesimal change in energy. 
in the open system right it's a change in energy internal energy again it's an infinite symbol change in the open system so this change in internal energy is equals to delta q in minus delta q out plus delta w in minus delta w out plus delta q plus delta w that is input the that is the heat input to the open system and delta w is the work done on the open system or work done by the open system it can be uh, on or by and depending on it we will put a uh, negative sign or a positive sign now so if you have that one interesting part of it is that before i go to enthalpy i want to tell you this in the flow arc that is coming in you have u bar in right that is the u bar in and you have u bar in plus p in v bar in right p and in right that's that's how it is and then you have minus u bar in plus p sorry this is minus right? so it is going out this is u bar out plus p out v bar out bm out and then you have u delta q and then w which is equal to q. now if you look at this term you have this term which is like u plus pv right and this is the uh, term that you have like u plus pv is coming in and then u plus pv is going out so it's like u plus pv in and then there is a u plus pv Now this I can call as in some way this I can call it as some h in and h out. I'm just putting some new variable here. Okay, now what is this h? So I'll define this h as enthalpy. So this now if you look at so it's enthalpy, which is h. Now why does this enthalpy why is this enthalpy required? Because you see we know from the first law for a closed system say that du is equal to delta q plus delta w and that is basically equal to delta q minus p d v now p minus p d v because uh, if you are say basically compressing a gas using a piston if you are compressing a gas using a piston you are compressing it with a pressure then there is a change in volume right there is a change in volume that dv is negative and you want what done on the system we are always assuming as positive right in our convention so i we put a minus sign here okay so you you can understand that it du equals to delta q minus pdv by the way if you use another convention it will you will get back the same minus pdv because in that case what is done against the external pressure right so in the in such a case where the volume is increasing the vo when the volume of a gas will increase say for example it is what done against external pressure here we are doing external pressure is doing the work on the system but in that process dv is negative so therefore i have to put a minus sign so in all in both cases it is consistent now what you get but that's not the matter here the matter is more interesting here that you have a delta u which is q q is the heat input remember q is the heat input minus p delta v so now you will tell is this correct minus p delta v there should be a v delta p so i assume so, for example, this that's why I gave a blank here. So, we are talking about constant pressure, and we are looking at energy balance at constant pressure. Now, if you are looking at constant pressure, then basically you will see delta delta u is nothing but q minus p delta v. 
Okay, so this is done at constant pressure. So Q becomes delta U plus P delta V. So it is something either more or less than delta U. Now can you tell me, so this is something that you can think about that Q is the heat input, right? Q is the heat, you can think of it as heat input. Now depending on whether it is negative or positive, we can tell whether it is going out to the surroundings or whether heat is entering the system. And delta U is the change in internal energy. You see, un unless it's a constant volume process, in that case delta V will be zero because the volume will not change. Then only Q equal to delta U. Other than that, Q is equal to delta U plus P delta V. Now, depending on P delta V, del delta U can be more than Q or delta U can be less than Q. Or is it that always Q is greater than delta U by an amount? Q differs from delta U by an amount V delta V. And to absorb this P delta V, we use a new thermodynamic potential called enthalpy. I will later tell you that how these different thermodynamic potentials basically come from uh, uh, doing this Legendre transforms, how they are related. Uh, basically, they, these are like conjugate variables. You will see different conjugate variables like entropy and temperature, volume and pressure, uh, chemical potential and concentration, and so on and so forth. But what I am trying to say is that you can immediately see the need of at constant pressure you have Q which is not just delta U but Q which is delta U plus P delta V. So now to make our life easy we define a, so every time we define a new state function in thermodynamics you remember we want to simplify our understanding or simplify the description. So we define this new state function called enthalpy which is U plus P V, right, P V is the mechanical work, what uh, did the mechanical work and U is the internal energy and H is called enthalpy. As U is extensive parameter, V is extensive parameter, H is also an extensive parameter, extensive variable, right, it's a extensive component variable. Similarly, U is a state function, U is a state function, so H is also a state function, right, it depends on the, 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 the the states only, it does not depend on the path, right? The, the finding H, I don't, uh, when I want to integrate, I have to know the initial state and the final state of the system. I don't have to know in which path these states are arrived at, right? So, an H bar is specific enthalpy. Specific enthalpy can be enthalpy per unit mass or enthalpy per unit mole, and we can call it H bar or HM. So, I will use either H bar or HM in this course. Right, so this is the enthalpy per mole, it can be enthalpy per mass, okay. So every time I will specify whether it is molar enthalpy or uh, uh, per, per unit mass. Now, what we told is that is a constant pressure. Now, why do we tell that? Because you see H equals to U plus P. Now, if I do differentiate, if I differentiate, I get dH which is du plus PdV plus VdP. Now, this only becomes du plus pdv when dp equal to 0, that means constant pressure. So, you see now du is equal to delta q plus delta w, which is delta q minus pdv, and as you can see, dh is du plus pdv. So, from here you can write delta QP equals to DU plus PDV. So, I gave a suffix P, um, right? Subscript P, I use this subscript P. To denote that it is at constant pressure. So, dH is equal to delta QP. That means heat input at constant pressure. So, in general, as you can see previously, we wrote du is equal to delta QV, which is at constant volume. This is constant process because if it is constant volume process, then delta V is zero. So, in the constant volume case, 
you have to use the delta q v and in this constant pressure i am now differentiating you see th equals to delta q p so as you can see here this is at constant uh, h is a uh, thermal potential that we will use when we are looking at processes where the pressure is constant right so something like that so we will come to see that more now if i look at a measurable change again i am integrating between the states so basically and uh, delta h basically delta h is equals to qp that is heat input at constant this is heat input at constant pressure this if this heat input at constant pressure changes my system from initial state i to a final state f then the difference hf minus hi which is basically you can express it as delta h this is a measurable change delta h is a measurable change so please note this that d of something say d of z is a infinite symbol change right it's a, it's a differential but when i tell delta of z it's a measurable change right so which is basically like z f minus z i where f and i denote are two states and dz basically is a differential it's a differential change and i have also told what is an exact differential so in constant volume as i told again it's du and at constant pressure it is p right so now at constant pressure one can write dh equals to as i told dh equals to du plus pdv and if you now integrate what you get is delta h equals to delta u plus p delta v because delta h is hf minus hi delta u is hf minus hi and delta v is hf minus v now let us look at a problem we will try to look at a problem and we will see because enthalpy is something very interesting in a constant pressure process many a times we use like um, uh, heat means uh, when we express uh, like heat of reaction or heat of uh, change of phase say from solid to liquid or liquid to solid or solid to gas or liquid to gas and some 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 such processes like evaporation condensation solidification melting we will use delta h we also use delta u if the process are constant volume otherwise at constant pressure we will always use enthalpy right we we, we call it like a transformation enthalpy or enthalpy formation and stuff so here for example i like given uh, a problem here which is enthalpy of fusion now enthalpy fusion means fusion is nothing but melting so of ice at 0 degree celsius remember ice and water are two phases or two states of h2o right of water so uh, liquid water and ice so at 0 degree celsius um, at 0 degree celsius both ice and water can coexist now enthalpy of fusion that is the it's like latent heat okay it that often we call it as latent heat also of fusion of ice at 0 degree celsius and one atmospheric pressure is 6 kJ per mole that means you have to supply 6 kJ per mole uh, of ice to melt it at 0 degree celsius now you see another very interesting thing molar volume of ice at 0 degree celsius is 0.0196 liters and of water is 0.018 liters you see this is liquid water remember ice is the solid form of water this is the liquid water it's called it liquid so water in the liquid form and ice is water in the solid form so if you see the solid form has a higher molar volume 0.0196 and water has a molar volume 0.018 Okay, at zero degree Celsius. Again, this is measured at zero degree Celsius. Now I am telling: find delta H and delta U. Find delta H and delta U of fusion at zero degree Celsius. Delta H of fusion I have already given six kilojoules per mole. Now we have to see whether it is positive or negative. So let us look at it. So the process is ice. 
melts to ice is melting to water right now there are two types of processes that generally we know you might have uh, also uh, read about it in your uh, uh, 12 standard textbooks or 11 standard textbooks that you have this endothermic process and exothermic process endothermic process is where heat is absorbed by the system and the heat is coming from surrounding so basically heat when heat is absorbed by a the system then um, uh, uh, and from the surroundings it is entering from surroundings that is getting absorbed by the system then you have something called an endothermic process and where heat is released or heat is evolved by the system and is released to the surroundings basically then it is called an exothermic process ok so exothermic process there are two types of processes in one case it is absorbed ok and another case it is given out so for example when I am looking at melting ice melting to water in that case ice requires heat input so it absorbs heat and then it melts to water on the other hand if water freezes to ice when water freezes to ice it gives out heat right it gives out the enthalpy of fusion now when it is giving out as you know in the endothermic process heat is absorbed by the system or heat is input to the system right so here what you can tell is basically heat input to system is positive on the other and on the other hand when it is an exothermic process system is giving out heat right so it is like heat output from the system so heat input in that way is negative because heat is extracted out of the system right or heat is evolved it is not really extracted it is released from the system to the surface. So heat input to system in this case is negative right so basically uh, because the system is giving out heat to the surroundings right. Now when surroundings is giving heat then ice transforms to water so ice absorbs heat right from the surroundings so it is an melting is an endothermic process freezing is an exothermic process so so at one atmosphere as we see one mole of ice requires 6 kilojoules of heat that means it requires 6000 joules now we also know the molar volumes right what molar volumes of uh, water and ice so as we know q basically is nothing but delta h here because we are keeping the pressure at one atmosphere right pressure is fixed so you have delta h q p that is the heat input at constant pressure which is delta h or heat of fusion and this is given as plus so it will be plus 6000 joules right so delta h equals to 6000 joules now i have to find out what is delta u of the process to find out what is delta u. Now we know the relation delta h equals to delta u plus p delta v, and we know the we know the molar volume of ice which is 0 0.0196 and this is 0 0.018. So now remember, one liter is one decimeter cube. So this is something that you have to know. The units one decimeter cube is like uh, point uh, one decimeter is like point one meter, uh, right? So you have um, decimeter cube so you have 0 0.001 meter cube and one atmosphere is 101325 pascals pascal is the unit of pressure right new uh, uh, pascal is newton per meter square and one atmosphere is also unit of pressure but one atmosphere means 101325 pascal now delta v is what it will be it is final state is water liquid water and the initial state is ice so it will be v water minus v ice right v water minus v and we are looking at only one mole of the system so we are taking the molar volume of water here at 0 degree celsius and this molar volume of ice and what do we get v water minus v ice is negative right it is negative right and it is like minus 1.6 and then minus 3 liters and p is one atmosphere so p delta v if i now convert atmosphere liter to joule you have to multiply with 101.325 this is because 1 liter is 0 0.001 meter cube and 1 atmosphere is 101325 if you multiply you get 101.325 as the conversion factor so if you use 101.325 you get a value 
which is as you can see here minus 0.162122 joules which is quite small it's very very small see 6000 joules is the enthalpy of fusion and p delta v term is only minus 0.162122 joules so as you can see here delta h is 6000 joules delta u is going to be 6000 minus of minus of 0 0.1, 0 0.16212 or this is 6000.16212 joules. So delta U is slightly more than delta H but it is not really that much different. So we get delta U to be approximately the same as delta H. Remember I have not given a, 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 a I have given a working definition of phase but I have not given the proper means the definition that is accepted in textbooks and stuff but phase basically see for example ice and water these are two states of matter and these are like you can call them as like two phases because they have their own physical characteristics like right? distinct physical characteristics and they have also uh, chemical composition right in both are like H2O right they, and H2O means basically one component I can think of water molecule water as H2O as one component these are like unary system consider water as a component and these are phases with physical characteristics which are distinct and they are also mechanically separable. So I will come to this mechanically separable stuff um, in a while. So um, when I give a more, uh, when I look at different phase, the equilibrium between phases um, uh, in a short while. So these are mechanically separable, these are physically distinct and they should have uniform chemical composition. Right, that is the idea. So the, the, the idea of mechanically separable is interesting and I uh, uh, will talk about like uh, mechanically separable means by some such process right. So uh, but there is a little bit of confusion there and I will come to that where it can be sometimes it can be confusing but uh, uh, but anyway uh, the point that I want to tell phase ice is a phase the solid phase of water liquid one and water uh, uh, liquid is also another phase. The solid phase has different property like different molar volume, different density. Water has different property like molar volume density, refractive index, whatever it is. And both are condensed phases. How? Condensed phases means they are, uh, I will talk about this, they are, they are compressibility like it is not as compressible as gas, right? So, water or ice are not as compressible as gas. Gas is much, much way more compressible. Right. So, in case of ice and water, both are called condensed phases. Means basically, the PV work in condensed phases, in condensed, con condensed phases, is like solids and liquids. PV work is Negligible. So again, I'll just give you give a working definition of phase. If you missed it, a phase is that portion of matter. Or phase of portion of matter, or region of matter, or region of space containing matter. So, is that portion of matter which is chemically homogeneous? Physically distinct and mechanically separate. For example, I 
I have a system where you have this eyes. And you have water. So see there is a clear boundary between ice and water. Although both are H2O, one is in the solid form, another is in the liquid form. They have different densities, they have different molar volumes, they have different refracting indices and so on and so forth. They are physically distinct. And both ice and water are chemically homogeneous, right? So, so as you can see, these are the phases. So this is again an ice cube, right? So ice and water is one example that I can talk about where I have two distinct phases. Liquid water is a different phase, ice is a different phase. Right? So, but you see that ice and water both are condensed phases, PV1 is negligible, right? Because the volume change with pressure is very, very small. You, you have to give enormous pressure to uh, see appreciable volume change, as much volume change as you see in gas, you can't get unless you give a really, really enormous pressure. So, PV work is negligible, but I will come to this PV work uh, soon. Now think of another reaction, so to understand the concept of enthalpy, right, uh, we think of a, a reaction where you have gas involved, where you have gas involved. So for example, we are thinking of combustion reactions, now in combustion reactions, you think of combustion, what do you think, you have fuel, that fuel can be liquid or solid, it can be gasoline, it can be, it can be uh, coal, coke, it can be like some pure form of graphite, whatever it is, and you are putting oxygen and you are giving oxygen and this graphite is burning, graphite and oxygen burn, graphite burns in oxygen and it gives you carbon dioxide. Right? This is the reaction C plus O2 equal to CO2. Now, in when combustion happens, in general it will produce heat. That's why you do we, we do use combustors, right? We want to produce heat. If you want to produce heat, for example, uh, you take wood and you put um, fire and you want, means when you want to uh, have fire, uh, then what you do, you basically uh, involve oxygen in it, right? You, you, without oxygen, you, the fire will die, right? So, the fire, the, the burning will happen if there is oxygen, right? So, so carbon plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide. Now, this reaction or these combustion reactions, all combustion reactions produce heat, right? You will produce heat. So, heat will be released to the surroundings. So, as a result, it will be exothermic and that means heat input is negative because heat is released to the surroundings, right? It is, as you can see here, it is released to the surroundings when this reaction happens. In the forward, right? Carbon solid, which can be coke, which can be graphite, a pure um, form of carbon, graphite, and that is reacting with oxygen, forming carbon dioxide, and this is producing heat, and this producing because it is producing heat, we call this reaction a combustion reaction. Right? So, so, all burning, all reactions where you burn fuel to produce heat are called combustion uh, reactions in presence of air. Right? The air basically helps in burn. Now, we are thinking of our temperature of, so the burning here or combustion is happening at 298 Kelvin. See? The temperature that you have, it is like room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, 298 Kelvin and you have one atmosphere pressure and in that temperature and pressure, molar volume of graphite is 0 0.0053 degrees, which is quite small, right? Look at molar volume of gases, remember at STP, you might have read, which is like 0 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere pressure, the volume is 20.4 degrees for ideal gases. Again, if you assume oxygen and carbon dioxide to be ideal gases, you can basically get the volume of one mole of a gas. So, R is 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin. You have PV equals to NRT, N equal to 1, because you are taking one mole, say, and then V is this, 8.314 and 298 by 101325, because, see, V is equals to NRT by and P is 1 atmosphere, which is 101325 Pascal or Newton per meter square. So, what you get is 0 0.02445 173 meter cube, which is 24.44 liters. So, as you can see here, 
24.45 liters is the volume of the gases oxygen or carbon dioxide on the other hand the molar volume of graphite well, that's for one mole of these gases on the other hand the volume of graphite one mole of graphite is 0 0.0053 liters you can see the, how much the volume differs for one mole and now let us look at okay uh, we understand that volume does differ but see ultimately if I am looking at if I give an ideal gas assumption I will use only the gases C plus O2 goes to CO2 so what is the delta H reaction it is given as minus 394 kilojoules per mole right so it means it gives out 394 kilojoules of heat it gives out 394 kilojoules of heat this reaction C plus O2 CO2 and at room temperature and pressure now this is minus 394 kilojoules of heat per mole. Now we are assuming oxygen and carbon dioxide to be ideal gases, and that means they follow this equation of step P equals to NRT. And we know H, which is U plus PV. Now instead of PV, I write U plus NRT. Now you have DH, which is TU plus DART. R is gas constant, it's constant, you can take it out. Now you have RTDN, RTDN, right? Because it's like R, D, N, T, and this will be R, D, N, and there is a T plus uh, um, N, R, D, right? So this is what it is. So you will have these two terms, R, T, D, N, N, R, D, T. But as you can see here, it is constant temperature 298 Kelvin, right? It is 298 Kelvin, constant temperature it is 0. So this becomes du plus rtdm. Now th plus du plus rtdm. Now I can also I can now integrate. So in, in, a, in a measurable form it will be delta h, right? In the finite form it is delta h because delta u plus rt delta m. The reaction is C solid combining with oxygen gas to give carbon dioxide gas in before reaction now if i am looking at the n i am not caring about the n of uh, graphite right i don't care about graphite so i will look at the n because i am using pv equals to nrt here so i look only at the gases participating gases o2 and co2 see this is like one mole of gas if you look at the balance and this is also one mole of it produces one mole of so one mole of oxygen reacts with one mole of carbon to give one mole of carbon dioxide. So N of gas before reaction is 1, after reaction is 1, delta N which is product minus reactant is 0. So delta H equals delta U plus 0 and delta H minus 30, 394 kilo per mole. So delta U equals delta H minus RT delta U. and therefore which is equal to 0 here. So delta U equal to delta H equals to minus 394 more. So and as you can see moles of carbon are not considered. So even, even in this case where gases are involved, you can see very interestingly that the change in internal energy and change in enthalpy means that is basically coming up to the same. Obviously, if you have a reaction like say for example, you you can do it yourself. Say I am talking about say N2 plus 3H2 equal to 2NH3. Now in this case, this is gas, right? This is gas and this is also gas, right? In such a case, and you can see here one mole of nitrogen, three moles of hydrogen and two moles of ammonia. These are some cases where you will see that there will be, there may be some difference between delta U and delta H. Basically, find out examples. You can find out examples, but delta U and delta H are different, right? So please have a think about it. Think about different reactions. I will also give some examples later. Now I'll come to a very important quantity called heat capacity. I'll come to a very very important quantity called heat capacity, and heat capacity is basically the amount of heat or thermal energy required by a substance, right, heat capacity of a substance or a material is the amount of heat or thermal energy required by a substance 
to raise to required by a substance to raise the temperature of this material or substance by some amount right it is not specified right in general but we will by convention use like by 1 degree celsius or by 1 kelvin now or by 1 degree fahrenheit say for example now i haven't even de uh, yet defined the kelvin scale but i am telling because you already know about kelvin scale so there are different types of temperature scales that you know you know like there is a centigrade scale there is a fahrenheit scale and there is also this absolute scale of temperature and obviously how does it come we have to cover it but before that what we understand is heat capacity heat capacity is a very very important property of matter now what we can write is so this is the amount of heat or thermal energy so that means this you can write some relation like this is something that we have often seen which is delta q which is equal to c dt right so basically c is a ratio between delta q and dt that means heat input and changing temperature right now if you think of this in general if you have a heat input to a system the temperature increases so you will have typically curves like this this is a curve u versus t so u increases as t increases and if you now draw if you take one point here if you take a point here, say here, you draw a common tangent line. So this is your common tangent line. You can now take the slope at that point. So this will be like you have this is delta u, this is delta t. So the slope is limit delta t tends to zero, delta u by delta t. Or you can also write this is equal to e u by t. Right now. This basically gives you C. Now, is it always du by dt? We will come to know. So, if you know at constant volume, it will be Cv. Okay. That means this is heat capacity at constant volume, which is delta Q, which is delta Q V by delta del T or del U del T V. Remember this. This is very important. Del U del T at constant volume. Right. It is constant volume. That is Cv. Now, when you look at constant pressure processes again what comes in is enthalpy not u right because you have enthalpy right at cost pressure as you know delta h is delta u plus p delta v so there is this p delta v one right for example think of this gas enclosed here and you are having a piston that is just coming in now you are seeing that there is a heat input and there is a pressure you are giving a pressure and the volume is changing so all of these contribute to the heat capacity at constant pressure right you have pressure volume work as well as heat input and that both of them are contributing to the constant pressure process right so at constant pressure we have to look at how h varies with temperature you will get essentially a very similar curve h will increase as a function of temperature Right? In general, H will increase the function of temperature. In that case, again, whether it is increasing or decreasing, is the slope, right? It is delta H by delta T. Again, with delta T tends to 0. So, this basically gives you delta Q by delta T or you can think of this as del H by del T at constant ratio. So, as you can see here, Cp is del H by del T P, right? C equal to del H by del T. So again, just recollect that we, we talked about exact differential, we talked about z equal to z x y, and if z is an exact differential, is m dx plus m dy, m is del z by del x with constant y, and n is del z by del y constant x, and you have also this del m by del y equals del m by del x, which gives rise to this, and these will be used to find some relations called Maxwell's relations. Or Maxwell relations. I'll come to that, but before that, 
uh, come to this second derivative because remember when you write making actual relations we are basically relying on this relation del m del y and del m del x which basically gives you second derivative right? these are the second derivative okay but see this exact differential gives you m and n now this m and n say for example u if i write as a function of t and v i get del u del t v t t plus del u del v t dv right so del u del t v at constant volume this is del u del v that is the change in internal energy with change in temperature at constant volume this is change in internal energy with change in volume change in internal energy with change in volume uh, at constant temperature right at constant temperature so you get cv dt and you get some coefficient like del u del v t which is pi t dv so but at constant if you take uh, think of constant temperature then du you know is minus p dv right because du is delta q um, say for example you can write this way du is equals to delta q minus p dv now delta q i can write as c d t minus p dv c is the heat capacity now I can take dt equal to 0, that means at constant temperature, then du is minus p dv. Now have a look at this. Now you have del u del t v, which is cv, right? Del u del t v, that is the change in energy temperature at constant volume, which is cv. And here you have pi t. And if you look at this relation here, du equals to minus p dv, and here this pi t is obviously having a unit of pressure, right? And this pi t, this coefficient is called internal pressure, right? Pi t is basically nothing but minus p if I compare that. So du is cv dt plus pi t dv and du equal to cv dt minus p dv. So as you can see, pi t is minus p, which is the internal pressure, right? So, however, remember, if you don't have, if, in fact, you can show it later, but now, Please understand, if there is no interaction between molecules, that is, there is no force of interaction between molecules, then PdV, which is nothing but force of interaction with the, so this is an interaction force and this is the, uh, I can think of like separation distance between, uh, between, between particles or molecules, then this PdV term or this inter internal interaction term basically goes to zero. This is not external pressure. Remember, this is the, uh, let's not call it, let's call it pi t. And pi t is the internal pressure which arises due to internal forces of interaction between the molecules. And if there is no force of interaction between molecules, for example, an ideal gas or perfect gas, okay, so, so R is like an um, interaction distance between these particles or uh, molecules or atoms. Now, if F interaction is zero, then pi t comes out to be zero. So, this is a very, very important conclusion. So, as you know, equation of state PV is NRT and you have CV which is del u del dv, right? Say del u del dv and CP which is del u del dv. We will try to find relations between them. We will also try to find, uh, not only find the relations between them, but we will also try to find out more measurable quantities that you can define like temperature, pressure, you have already uh, looked at different variables that we can, uh, so what variables so far we have learned that are measurable directly, the T or temperature which is measurable by a thermometer, then you have P which is measured by a barometer and then you have CP and CV, these things you can measure basically using calorimetry, okay, you can use calorimeters to measure it. So I will give you some principle means how it is done. The principle is based on what I have taught, right? It's basically the first law. Uh, first law is what you use. So, uh, so you use calorimetry to find out CP, CV. So these are measurable quantities. Temperature is a measurable quantity. Pressure is a measurable quantity. Volume again, if I know the dimensions, I can calculate volume. Measurable quantity. So we are getting a bunch of measurable quantities. I will also give, give some more measurable quantities, and we will try to find out interrelations between them. Right? That's, that's something very very important. When you want to organize data and all, you require all these thermochemical data consistently, then only you can give an energy description of matter. So, this is something that I will deal with in the next uh, class.
थैंक यू थैंक्स फॉर यूर